Got a minute. We are live on YouTube. Great. All right. Well, welcome everybody to Poppy Hour. I want to start with uh, the land acknowledgement. We're broadcasting from Sun Valley, the headquarters of uh, Theodore Payne Foundation, which sits on Wakonga, the ancestral village uh, of the Tatabium uh, Band of uh, Mission Indians, the Fernandinho Tatabium Band of Mission Indians. So, welcome. Um, if you've tuned into Poppy Hour before, welcome back. If this is your first time, welcome. Um, we always start with a plant, and this time we're going to start with a plant that's near and dear to my heart. This is the laurel sumac, also known as Melasma lorina. And I don't want to talk too much about the plant itself. I want to talk about its strategy for dealing with wildfires. And uh, wildfires are on my mind right now for obvious reasons. The apocalyptic sky being uh, one of those reasons, but um, not only for bad things. I think, you know, we think of wildfire as this very destructive thing that um, can burn our houses and, and burns down plants, um, but it's actually natural and it can be regenerative too. And um, I've been kind of thinking about wildfire as a metaphor for this year, which has been so bizarre and so dark in so many ways, but hopefully regenerative in its own way as well. Um, and, and I think the Laurel Sumac is a very beautiful example of that regenerative um, possibility that we can feel this year. This is a plant that has a woody lignotuber. Um, so basically it has sort of a swollen area right around its uh, crown, the root, and it stores energy there. So when the fire comes through, it'll burn the top off the entire plant. And you would think that it is completely dead. It just looks like a bunch of charred sticks. But if you come back a few months later after the rains have come, it has flushed out new growth and in time it'll grow back to be just as vibrant and beautiful as it ever was. And I think as we evaluate our place in the world this year, um, our place as gardeners, as environmentalists, as Angelinos, as Americans, as global citizens, that's a pretty awesome um, message that sometimes things um, being impacted in negative ways can be very regenerative. And I hope that that will be true um, for the California native plant community and for all of you tuning in tonight. So thank you for joining us up on Poppy Hour. Season two, welcome back everybody. My name is Evan Meyer and the executive director here uh, at Theodore Payne Foundation. And this season, we're really going to switch things up totally, which means that I will not be hosting this time. And my co-hosts uh, from the previous season, I wanna thank profusely, Margaret Oakley and Philip Otto um, did a great job with season one. Season two, we're regenerating and uh, regrowing our landscape with a new uh, duo here to host. This is uh, a team who I'm really excited and I think you guys are really lucky to have some fantastic hosts this season. Um, our community and outreach team of Brenda Kyle and Aaron Johnson. So I'm gonna introduce them uh, one by one here. I'll start with Brenda. Um, if you volunteered at Theodore Payne Foundation, you have met Brenda. And if you've ever been to one of our plant sales and, and volunteered there and had the amazing food that's always uh, available, that's Brenda's doing. Um, and Brenda, as, as a volunteer coordinator and community outreach coordinator, she's working um, on the front lines of, of sharing the message of California native plants across the city. So she's also partnering with all kinds of different nonprofits and, uh, and groups throughout the city to share our message. Um, and in her personal life, she brings a really strong background in, um, in being a naturalist and in being someone who is very devoted to, the, uh, to environmental justice and making sure that diverse communities have access to nature and that it's equitable across the city. Um, so welcome, Brenda. And I'll welcome the other host as well. Aaron, Aaron Johnson, who is our uh, is our uh, outreach manager. Aaron comes to uh, native plants via the conservation world, via Atlas Obscura, where she ran all of the Southern California um, Atlas Obscura events, and actually worked throughout the whole country. And she brings um, a lot of you know the wonder and beauty and joy that. Uh, that we feel in nature to, to this role. So we're really lucky to have both of them working for Theodore Payne Foundation. And with that, I am lucky to pass the baton off to season two, Brenda and Aaron. Hey guys, let's unmute you. So. 
Hey, thanks so much for the introduction, Evan. Thank you, thank you. Glad to be here and we can't do this without Scott doing everything behind the scenes. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> yep, adult education manager Scott Share um, is behind the scenes. So, so tonight, you know, we've been through a, a crazy year as I was mentioning and I kind of was alluding to coronavirus, but there's been a whole other thing happening, which is we've been really examining a lot of uh, deep-seated issues of, of the history of the country that we live in, um, which we'll get deep into tonight. I'm kind of foreshadowing here, but I think it's worth setting up this conversation. If, if people hadn't tuned in um, last season, we did an episode on, on environmental justice, but I think it's worth kind of defining that before we get going tonight. So I wonder, Brenda and Aaron, if you guys want to just quickly kind of define that for, for the audience, because um, that's going to set the tone for the rest of our conversation. Okay, so I'll, I'll start. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, the things that have been happening in our country are, are not new. They're new to a lot of audiences, but some of us know they've been going on for, you know, a couple hundred years. Um, it, news is just traveling faster because of social media. But it, environmental justice um, is the equitable distribution of the burden of pollution. That's the, the easiest way that, that I can um, explain it. And hopefully later on, Hop will be able to elaborate. Erin, anything to add? Great, yeah, we, we really wanna also welcome everyone um, to this conversation. And if it's something that you're new to, we're gonna try to um, step back and, and define some of the terms and um, I know for all of us, um, uh, for me, I, somebody who is, you know, I don't have a background in environmental justice and it's been an incredible transformative period. And while, you know, you know Evan gave this great metaphor of this transformation that's happening, this metamorphosis that's happening. Um, I, at the end of the day, I feel really, sorry, my phone's going off. <laughs> um, uh, I think we're, going to end up in a much, much better place. So um, yeah, we're gonna continue to think and reflect and learn. And we're really excited to have Hop start and to roll the ball here with us and kick this off. Yes, so um, a, part, a big part, uh, the Sierra Club was responsible for environmental justice and a lot of other movements across the country are the Jemez principles. And if you're not familiar with those, the number one principle that came out of that meeting in Jemez, New Mexico was to be inclusive. Um, number three was to let the people speak for themselves. And the very last one, and I don't know if it's last because it's the one that we should remember the most, but it's um, a commitment to self-transformation. It's not just the transformation of communities, it's the transformation of self. So with that, Hop, are you ready for us? Actually, guys, can I jump in real oh, quick? Sure. Sorry, Hop. I, I, I'm really want to hear Hop, but I do have to do a few quick plugs. Um, oh, that's right. Which, we, which we, is important. So yes, welcome back to Poppy Hour, folks. And um, as a reminder, Poppy Hour is about plants. It's about Los Angeles. It's about Southern California. It's about the environment. Um, we, we're not a political organization, but sometimes things have to get political to some extent, and I'm sure they will tonight. So I just give that as a kind of disclaimer off the top of this is stuff. If you don't want to hear about politics, you might want to uh, not watch right now. I'll just say that. Um, but I do need to just quickly plug a few things uh, with the org. So coming up, um, we have our fall plant sale. It's the first three weeks of November. We just locked that in. So hope to see you guys all there. We've got amazing crops coming in this year. Some of them were hit by the fire, but we're, we're working hard to clean everything up. Uh, sorry, excuse me, hit by the heat wave. Um, so that's the first three weeks of November. We also have some upcoming fire uh, safety landscaping talks, which will be free. So I hope you can all tune into that. Um, we're just figuring out the garden tour this for this year, which will be probably like a hybrid model, um, video, uh, half video, half in person if it's safe. So stay tuned. If you want to host this year, we would love to have you. The uh, applications will be going out very soon. Um, there's 
ton of great programming. Scott has really ramped up adult education on uh, over Zoom, and we're, we're even going to be doing some socially distant outdoor events this fall. So check out our Eventbrite page for all those offerings. And then a fun one, we're doing a Halloween, uh, Halloween costume contest. And anyone who wears a costume and comes to, to TPF uh, on Halloween gets a free pack of poppy seeds and best costume is gonna get a gift certificate. Um, and we are very much in favor of homemade costumes and botanically themed costumes are the best. So those are the plugs. I'm gonna now sit back, let um, Brenda, Aaron and Hop guide us through this really fascinating and important uh, conversation that they'll have. All right, welcome Hop, uh, are you there? <laughs> I can see you. Howdy, can you hear me? Uh, yes, 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 yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here for, for us. I, I really appreciate that. Um, let's start with a, a quick bio um, from Texas, right? You want me to give you my bio? Oh, no, I'm going to ask you some questions. So oh. that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test your Texasness, <laughs> right? Texas okay. or Resistol? Yes. 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 Which one? I couldn't hear you because I'm talking and there might be a little delay. <laughs> All right. Stetson. We're doing that thing we do when we get to gay, we talk over each other. Oh, it, I know. We do that all the time. So yeah. Stetson or Resistol? Stetson. Justin or Tony Lamas? Uh, Justin for the ropers and Tony Lama for going out. When's the last time you roped? Oh, that's been a minute. <laughs> a hot minute, I bet. All right, so the question, the last question, huh? I'm gonna totally judge you for. You didn't say Lucchese. I'm sorry. N never mind. <laughs> you, you didn't ask me about Lucchese's. That's not, that's out of my price range. Uh, <laughs> so the last question is very important. I'm gonna judge you forever on it. Sweet grits or savory grits? Grits all day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hop. I know. So hop, you, you've been um, from Dallas to Alaska on a fishing boat, right? You've organized all over the, um, the Western United States. And now you're here, you're local and on your farm on the urban wild interface. Can you take us on a little tour? Uh, around that? Sure. Sure. Yeah. We live in the foothills uh, of the, San Gabriel Mountains, or what is what is now called the San Gabriel Mountains, which is on the unceded um, and occupied land of the, Chong, of the Chumash and Tongva people. I really want to uh, honor that and bring uh, those folks into the room because they're still here and we're on their land and we're trying to do the best that we can. Um, we should be doing the best that we can in order to um, preserve this land and keep it together. And of course, the recent wildfires, which the Bobcats probably about four and a half, five miles from us right now. Uh, it's probably burned over 120,000 acres at this point. Um, and I'm sure you all have been part of conversations about why we're having the types of wildfires we're having, how much can be attributed to climate change and how much can be contributed to our different land management pro uh, processes. Um, I used to also be a director for the Los Angeles Conservation Corps and I ran, uh, and I was a volunteer firefighter in another life in Michigan. And oh, that I, I didn't know. Yeah, oh, that's right. Hot. And when I moved back to LA, I helped start a AmeriCorps project, a wildland firefighter certification program that was designed to uh, encourage, recruit and train um, uh, black indigenous and people of color with an emphasis on, on women of color, young women of color to get into the fire service and particularly get into wildland fire service, which we know of course is a challenge for anyone to get, but for, particularly for people of color and for women due to racism, sexism, and that field in itself being a little bit uh, um, insular, uh, it was challenging for those folks to get um, certified and then once they got certified to also get into the fire service. Now why I bring that up is because we also know that recently legislation was passed that allowed for prison uh, folks who were serving prison uh, sentences who had a history of fighting fires. Uh, we, we worked with those uh, constituency members 
which was part of the reason why we started the fire service program at the LA Conservation Corps, which was to help young men and women coming out of the juvenile system and out of the uh, judicial system to get gainful employment. And we found rather quickly that although they could get certified, they oftentimes could not legally um, gain um, entry into the fire service, even though it had been on multiple fires, their time being incarcerated. So we can see how, again, racism is at play even in the environment where we're trying to uh, navigate uh, the wildland urban interface and protect our um, commercial and residential communities that uh, lie in the interface between the wildlands and urban infrastructure. So when there's, there's this period, there's this uh, area right in between that, what we call the wildland urban interface, where like, like we, uh, we, all, we will see bears, bobcats, mountain lions, raccoons, coyotes, uh, those types of things interacting with our um, pets and our files. So what I'll do, I think we were supposed to spend a little bit of time um, and I got the sun right there <laughs> splitting me. It's like a racing stripe. So let me move around and um, we'll, we'll show you uh, my, our coop. This is our, our coop here. I think you all can see that. I feel like a blogger. Yeah, that's so, a fancy coop. There's our coop. Yeah, well, it's a Teflon upgrade from what we had before. Uh, there's our tool shed, and here's a little bit of our boneyard there. And if you live on a farm or out in the back where you often have a boneyard somewhere, things are, you hope you're going to get to them to repair them one day. <laughs> sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Uh, so, yeah, we have uh, four different breeds of chicken, of chicken here, of chickens. We have uh, no roosters, um, only hens. And we have uh, 13, uh, lucky number 13 here. And I'll take you inside and then I'll show you around there. And I'll talk a little bit about feet. And please put in the chat, the chat's pretty quiet. I don't know if you guys have a culture of, of using the chat, but for the folks who are watching, hopefully there's more than just us watching right now that you all will be active in the chat. And I'd really love to know how many people keep chickens, how many people support urban chickens, what kind of chickens you have. Uh, if they have names or not? Do you grow uh, layers or do you go? Do you grow for um, for meat? What's your relationship to to chickens? So uh, here's our uh, coop with some good uh, air ventilation. Um, I hope no one has vertigo. And I'll show you around back, but we have our perch our perches up here, some nesting boxes in the back. We also have uh, some rabbits. They live in the house with us mostly in the daytime, but then at night we put them here in the coop. Um, let's see, we have uh, some water features here. We have a, a double wall insulated. Uh, this is a, I think this is a five gallon one here. And then we have another little a bucket that uh, circulates a little bit of water to keep it flowing and um, so the chickens have a little bit of interest here. They like to scratch around and peck. Uh, they also like to peck each other. And then here we have uh, one of two feeders that we have and we fill it from the top and so and it, uh, it's just gravity fed. And then we use a whole grain organic feed, not a pellet. So you can see there that, that has uh, different types of grains. Uh, we use a, cor a corn-free uh, and soy-free organic mix, and we can talk a little bit about that if folks have questions. Looks like we've got a few aspirational um, chicken owners here, <laughs> and a few who have chickens. We've got one that has um, six layers for eggs in the coop, um, and we've got a few others with chickens. I also, I had chickens here, um, and then they all, um, one by one over the years passed away. We only had four. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we've, uh, looks like we got you on mute, Hop. Oops. Maybe, did I put myself on mute? Yeah. Oh, Can you hear me? You're back. All right, cool. See, we have a few people who've got a little bit of FOMO. They don't have chickens, would love to have them. Uh, I also sit on the LA Food Policy Council Advisory Committee and have done that for, for a while. And um, we're actually be working with the city of LA to get some of our uh, city regulations changed so that uh, we have a better, more opportunity for folks to um, be involved in small scale backyard homesteading and urban agriculture. Um, we also, a uh, big shout out to LA Food Policy Council staff and advisory board members who might be watching. Uh, really appreciate y'all. 
we intervened in a multi-year uh, campaign to get um, backyard beekeeping in the city of Pasadena because it was not uh, legal. So we had that ordinance changed. Um, we also offer here, um, and I see the question about rice, about, uh, sorry, not rice, but rats and mice, and we'll get to that in a second. I offer them uh, a calcium supplement to help with their egg production or to make their egg shells harder. This is uh, oyster shells. We get this from a sustainable source. You know, uh, we don't actually go out and, and catch the oysters, but oysters are in production and we get them from a place that, that has some relatively decent practices. So we offer that to the chickens to help with their, their eggs. What else can I show you here? I think that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, we have another water feeder here. It's really important to keep your chickens fed. If you're thinking about getting chickens, definitely make sure you get more than two chickens. Chickens, they operate in a flock and uh, they also have a pecking order. So if you only have one chicken, that one chicken's gonna stay on the bottom of the peck, of that pecking order for a long time. And that's real. Um, and then here is where all the magic happens, at least for the chickens and for us is eggs. I already harvested our eggs today, but these are our, our nesting boxes. We also, these are, some of the chickens are new. We use uh, wooden eggs to encourage them to just show them because sometimes they'll lay uh, in the run. We don't really want that sometimes. So we encourage them to lay by putting wooden eggs in the nesting boxes. They get the general idea of where they go. So there's that. And this is a good feature. I just want to show you, this is the only rooster we, we, we can manage these days. <laughs> He's pretty quiet, which we love. Um, and this is the double doors, which we learn have double doors that open and one that self locks, it locks on you. And then here are the roost here. And we put the roost, it's important, uh, so they're not fighting at night when they want to roost that the roosts are all on the same level. So they all get to be on the same level. No one's fighting for the tops. Cause chickens, they roost in trees at night much like urban peacocks. We have peacocks up here and they roost in trees. Um, and then there you go. The big feature I wanna show you, which was a little, there are many upgrades from our first chicken coop um, that we learned, but this here is, if there was some sound effects, maybe when they edit this, they can put some sound effects in, but see that handle right here? That's, that's like the million dollar upgrade. Now watch, careful. That's the money right there. So when having to reach myself in there with a broom or a shovel or a pitchfork to clean out the coop, we made this a drawer that pulls out and here's my uh, wheelbarrow. And I can just uh, use my trusty gloves. I just use my hand, but you can use a, a rake or whatever. And I just push that over into the, into the um, wheelbarrow and that slides in and out just like butter. And then you come over here, you don't have to go more than five feet. And this is our composting. This is composting central right here. So from the coop to the composting, it's really easy. Your, your 10 year old, nine year old, your, your partner, whoever, your next door neighbors can help you compost. So we have a number of different, this is a bio stack here that's uh, in the process. This is a homemade composting box here that we have. That's uh, newly, um, newly uh, filled. I do a, 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 a coop method called deep litter, deep litter, which I only change the coop, I only clean the coop out every like three to four months, but I keep adding new material. And so as a chicken scratch for worms and insects, they're actually compost, self-composting their own poop. Here's, um, this is a composting, a different type of composter that's actually, actually act, actively getting filled. And uh, as it gets higher, I'll put this on. And then that's the lid that goes on it just like that. So that's our composting area. And I've learned over the years, put the tools that you need real handy. I have a couple different pitchforks. Can, let's see, can you see that right there? And I have one also on some a nail here, my pitchfork here. And this is the nail for my shovel that you saw inside the chicken coop that I was using to do some things. Now, rats and mice, if you have animals, they go hand in hand with animal husbandry because there's feed. And so will songbirds actually. And so we have to really be careful. There's there, that's better. See, I'm not really a vlogger, I have to do this, but now this is like pretty cool. I mean, if you're a hedonist, you like to look at yourself, vlogging might be just the thing to do. Um, so you can see this is hard wire cloth and it's like about a uh, half an inch, not even a quarter, about a quarter inch squares. So mice cannot get in here. If you use chicken wire, mice and rats 
can go easily in and out and so can songbirds. And you'll find that you're feeding the whole neighborhood and squirrels will get in too if you let them get in. So we use hard wire cloth to keep out any predators, uh, snakes, um, uh, rats or anything like that that might get in and vermin. And rats can be really unhealthy if you get them in your coop with the poop, they'll take up resident and they'll eat your feed and then they could just cause and, right, and mice too. And so what we've done is we've, you can see we've done a pretty good job and I'll take you around to the back side of the coop to show that uh, it's all the way around. And then at the bottom here, we might take a little bit more time. We'll get to some things. We put these big rocks here. So we put the hardware cloth all the way out to about two feet out so that digging animals will be deterred from digging and getting in underneath. And then the rocks here, uh, in case they do dig in, the weight of the rocks will collapse the tunnel that they're digging and it'll help them. And so there's also water in the inside of the coop. And so in the places where there's eaves, like on this backside, because our roof is our roof is slanted. On the backside, we put the hard wire cloth up in the cracks and crevices. Up in the cracks and crevices so it deters the mites and the rats from getting inside and creating problems. And then, you know, we can also have a couple of nice dogs. We've got some two Australian cattle dogs here that also like to sit. It's like the animal channel for them. They watch the chickens and if anything comes by, they often will drop the carcass by the front door to let us know they're doing their job. It's kind of an exchange system. They take care of the varmints and we give them treats. Um, and then here, um, and Brenda, you're gonna have to shout at me to let me know how much time we have, but we keep our feed. We um, have an hour and a half. <laughs> okay. So we keep our feed in these five gallon buckets with this really nice feature. I wish someone had done this for me. This is like better than YouTube University, man. You're talking like 15, 20 years of educational tips that, you know, killed and maimed chickens from wildlife that we just didn't protect, right? We've learned a lot how to protect our coop and how to protect our animals. That's really important. Um, they, they sell these spin-off tops at uh, Home Depot, at the Home Depot. You probably order them online too, but you know, right now let's try to support our local businesses. Local hardware stores might carry them too. And this lid here, it, it pops on top of a five gallon bucket and it turns any five gallon bucket into a food or storage container. And you can buy food grade, food grade containers that, that are okay for you and okay for your, for your animals. So we, feed, we store our feed here close to the coop. Um, we do soak this at times. And many of you who are into, into um, diet know that when you soak seeds and nuts, you actually activate them right? You all know that. You activate the enzymes and you get a higher level of protein and all those good things. And so chickens like them too. And you can also use that to stretch your feed. Of course, soaked seeds and grains are more nutritious. They'll eat less because you're getting access to more of the grains and it's easier on their diet. So right now I just don't have the time, but usually I have it. I have a three-day rotation. Uh, the seeds soak for two days or they can soak for eight hours. But when I bring one out and I'll put it sometimes in the, in the little pan that you saw the galvanized pan and then they will go for that sooner than they will for anything else. Pop, and, a lot of what you do is centered about around food scarcity and food deserts. Can we start yes. talking about that? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about it. So yeah. that, that's a good point. So let's do that and talk about all these other things and I'll sit my, sit my, sit my ass down and then we can we can, we can get into it, but it's all, it's all here. So we live in a semi-rural environment and we are lucky enough to have the space to do some things. It isn't always so, and it isn't that way for everybody. And that's part of being in a food desert or when we talk about sacrifice zones. Um, yes, food apartheid, Sarah. Sarah, I see you, UCLA, EDU, let's talk. Um, yes, and so we are fortunate enough to have um, space to do this. And so we do, because for me as a person of color living in a, racist society oftentimes, and I've lived in many places and in many of those places in those communities of working class, people of color and working class white communities, there wasn't uh, readily access to fresh food. And those are places what we call uh, food deserts. When some people just call it really food apartheid, that's a more specific issue where you're actually um, restricting the right for people to have food. And none of these, you know, these aren't like uh, benign decisions. These are market driven, sometimes very politically driven. And if you go back far enough, there's a book called The Color of Law. I should have brought it. 
I did bring some other books that I do want to talk about. So we're going to, we're going to do that with some of these things. Not all of them are on agriculture, permaculture, but some of them are good reading. The Color of Law really takes the history of urban planning and, um, and looks at how it specifically was, was uh, formulated in ways to marginalize uh, communities of color. But if you think about, I guarantee if you go to any city, look at where the hospitals are, look at where the universities are, look at where the highways are, look at where the sports stadiums are, look at where mostly any public project, public works project there, and, and then go back far enough to find out who and what communities were living there before. And you're usually gonna find that those communities were working poor, working class, white communities, immigrant communities, or communities of color. And those communities were deemed as having less political power and clout, so they would be able to resist less the disturbance of their community. So oftentimes when these public projects went in, those whole communities were raised, usually through eminent domain. Sometimes those folks were given a market rate for their property, sometimes they weren't. Sometimes they were given a choice and sometimes they weren't given a choice. And oftentimes they destabilized um, the economic center of those communities. So uh, we have the opportunity to do that. We specifically ch chose out the Dina living up here in the St. Gables because of its agricultural uh, background um, and its proximity to the San Gabriel Mountains um, and our love for the outdoors. So, uh, and when we lived here, there are part, parts of this area that don't have access to fresh food. Uh, mostly when you think about food apartheid, you'll see uh, corner stores, right? Liquor stores and stores that don't sell fresh produce or healthy options. Um, so that's there. And so for me, the one self one act of self-determination was to learn how to grow my own food. So coming from the South in East Texas, my uh, uncles uh, uh, had farms and we oftentimes spent our summer there. Uh, we actually moved from, from East Texas to Dallas as a kid, but most of my family is still there. In fact, uh, my relatives are on the land that our distant ancestors were, were enslaved on. That land is now in our, families, in our family's hands. So the very plantation that our families worked and lived on as slaves some of my family lives on that land today. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you're from the South, you have those roots, agricultural. Um, is there um, a portion of different populations that maybe see agriculture and, and by extension the outdoors as kind of um, uh, something that we wanna get away from? There's, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, generational trauma attached? And is, is that, is that a, a fair assumption? I can say that my wife, um, my wife's parents are not from this country, they're from Central America. And uh, we oftentimes go camping and they're like, why am I gonna go sleep on the dirt? I already did that shit. That's right. <laughs> Right. I don't I don't I don't really need that experience. I mean, if you want to go take a, a walk in the woods, I'm cool with that. But, you know, so there's some there is some generational trauma, both economic and political uh, related to some of what we we take for granted ways and for the same reasons. One of the things that when I first came to the Sierra Club as a consultant, I was helping with the San Gabriel uh, Mountains campaign with the organization called San Gabriel Mountains Forever. Now, I think they're called Green for All or Nature for All. Nature for All. Yes. Um, and that had been, had started out as a very traditional lands conservation, you know, national monuments campaign. But as we, we recognize that the San Gabriels in the shadow of the San Gabriels live the, den the most densest, densest population of people of color. And they had very limited access to this natural resource. And, and many people, many more people visit the San Gabriels than some of the other more popular, more famous national parks but there was limited access to those communities of color. Most access were in often well-to-do or predominantly white communities with limited access with, uh, and access routes were not necessarily on public transportation routes. So it was very difficult for those communities to get there. So we had to really think about the orientation of that campaign and really tried to, and then we partnered and we were getting some critiques from environmental justice organizations that said, hey, what are you all gonna do in the management plan about giving communities of color and working poor and working class white communities access to this natural resource is that if that's not part of your your management plan then what what are you doing who are you really creating these these opportunities for so um 
Yeah, Brenda, that's that's a really good question, you know, and um, you've helped out with some of our homeschooling program programmatic work in the in the summer, and that's also Panther, something we, we homeschool. Ridge Farm. Panther Ridge Farm. We homeschool our children in a collective with other families, and um, we run a summer program for them that's very that's nature based with along with our education program and we take them from the mountains to the sea talk about the water cycle the mineral cycle and how to be good stewards of how to be good stewards of their of their backyard and explore um and learn about what's happening um so um let's see so yeah um and i saw someone say that they were from belize and I see someone from the South grew up as a sharecropper. Yep, I, I resonate with that very much. Uh, that's exactly what she says. Yeah, I, well, I gotta go sleep on the dirt. So yeah, and, and I think, and let me just say this, the Sierra Club has been on this equity and justice journey for about 10 years, which attracted me to the organization. When I was consulting, I wanted to uh, look at how could I make it a, a larger impact around climate change. It had been a significant concern for me for at least 15, 20 years. And I wanted to look at um, organizations that had the capacity to make a significant impact. And the Sierra Club, being 128 years old now, going on, uh, was really the the, the uh, founder of the modern environmental movement, right? Uh, John Muir, um, and of course, we've had some uh, recent um, owning of our of our founder's history. Um, I like that. Washington, Own the history. Washington, own the history, of, own the history. Of, I like that. of some of the problematic uh, positions and beliefs that he had. And many of our founders um, in the beginning of the organization um, were eugenicists. Um, they were racist. Uh, and we have to own that history and that it was a club. Since the name, the Sierra Club, it was a club for predominantly for wealthy white, um, white outdoor and adventurers. And uh, it was very exclusive and it had a sponsorship program, meaning that you couldn't become a member in the organization unless you were sponsored by at least one other member. And that was to help keep out working class white folks, people of color, indigenous people and immigrants that hadn't yet earned the category of being white. Uh, so owning that helps us be able to transform. Uh, and you mentioned the MS principle, uh, self-transformation is a huge part of it. But if you don't really own that history, uh, it's very difficult to transition and transform into something else. Uh, so let's see, you'd ask about, uh, why was I riffing on that? I don't know, but I have another question. <laughs> sure, I see, Aaron, I see Aaron smiling right there. So if Aaron has a Aaron question, has you want to get her in there. Yeah. I do, that's been, actually you covered my first question, which was, it was great to hear um, you talk about the history of the Sierra Club and how it's changed and, it's really exciting to see big green, um, a big green like that really leading the way. Um, and, you know, you've lived in so many places across the country and, um, and from reading some of your articles and hearing some of your interviews, it sounds like um, your experience of the country has also informed um, your, how you got involved in environmental justice and how you, um, how you came to the work that you're doing. So could you talk just a little bit about um, about how you became involved? Sure, that's a good question. And, um, wow, we're gonna give you the Cliff Notes version of that. And I'm sure many of your, <laughs> many of your viewers know what Cliff Notes are and many others probably don't. Um, but I'll try to be brief. So, wow. Um, I can't remember when I, when I, when I didn't, when I wasn't involved, and I think that's the story of most people of color, whether or not they consider themselves or call themselves environmentalists, conservationists, or activists, or organizers, because of our conditions, oftentimes we're, we're advocating for our humanity uh, uh, almost as soon as we, if definitely when you enter to public education or even educational system, you're definitely uh, being impacted by belief systems, by structures that uh, have you immediately begin to understand that your life actually isn't valued that your life actually means less uh, than other people's and the considerations for you and your personhood and how and what what people think is possible for you in your life you learn at an early age it's, it's, it's truncated from others that you might be in in relationship with who are not uh, people of color and anti-black racism is, is definitely real it's one of the founding hallmarks of this country as well as anti-indigeneity 
um, because the founding of this country uh, is a process called white settler colonialism, which uh, deemed this land as you know, kind of uninhabited, even though there are people here, right? That is the, the doctrine of discovery. And I go into this a little bit in the racism is killing the planet piece. So I'm not gonna do the whole full history here. And you did, Aaron, ask me about my history and I'm really trying to relay a story to you about how in, in some ways, if, if you're, and I'll just speak about my own experience as a black person, I never felt like I had the opportunity not to be an activist, not to be engaged in advocating for my own rights, which is actually tiring, tiring. Um, and um, it's highly problematic. So um, I guess where did it really start politically? I guess it really started politically when I left um, college in Texas and I went to Alaska and I had become um, vegetarian in Texas. And in the early 80s, that was not heard of. <laughs> Although Whole, Food, Whole, Foods, Whole, Foods came out of, Whole Foods came out of Texas, well, being a vegetarian in Texas, boy, that, that's something like, like to get you killed. <laughs> I just, you know, that, that, that's just not something that happens. But yeah, I did become vegetarian in uh, Texas and um, shortly thereafter became vegan. Um, but the, the process from vegetarianism was mad cow disease. When that happened, and they basically killed all the cattle in Great Britain at that particular point, or a section of Great Britain when mad cow broke out. That's how much of a serious threat they thought it was and serious intervention that they made was this was a disease that had jumped from sheep to cattle and from cattle to humans. And I think that was the first time in history that a disease like that had actually happened. And it, it, it happened because of poor agricultural processes, right? Basically using the remains of sheep, uh, particularly their spinal cords and their organs that, that, that accumulated uh, this particular uh, disease and then grinding it up and feeding it to cattle and feed. And so then the cattle would eat that feed and that disease would still be present and then they actually got it bovine and stuff like something bbs or bsv i can't remember what the scientific name is but for short it's mad cow and then you could you could eat a, a cow who'd been infected by this disease and somewhere between zero and 10 years later you could get you could get um this neuromuscular nervous system disease and i was like wait up i could eat a burger a day and then somewhere between now and 10 years from now i could catch i could get show symptoms of, and be and fall prey to this disease. And then I began to examine why that was, what kind of practices allowed for that to happen. And I realized they were feeding vegetarians the remnants of other vegetarians. And I was just like, whoa, whoa what's up? So that really got me into it. And then I was also into punk music, which is a very, for me, a, you know, a very political orientation uh, and the lyrics and the musicians, Black Flag, Minor Threat, Bad Brains. Some of those folks were really talking about uh, a number of things and punk rock and veganism kind of go hand in hand any punk rockers out there <laughs> I don't get in a mosh pit anymore with my with my ropers on but I still love to, to you know headbang a bit um bad brain Sarah wall I see you eye <laughs> against eye I don't that's right as a punk rocker hop I think you're well, a stepper yeah well you know I was kind of an odd I was kind of an odd, oddball I don't think that's really changed I didn't really dress like a punk you know, uh, but I hung out with, with, with the punks in the parking lot and in that particular portion of the cafeteria. Um, so anyway, that was my political beginnings was through music and culture, really. My own coming up in the South and experiencing white supremacy and racism firsthand, uh, moving to the South side of Chicago, encountering punks and skate culture and house music, by the way, in the, in the Vodoliak era. And I witnessed Harold Washington win a, a historic mayoral race, uh, a friend of mine, you know, I got introduced to the Black Panthers and the number in the Harlem Renaissance, a whole number of things happened. So it was through poetry, reading, real life people and observed politics that I really got into it. And the, and the interest was in agriculture, was, it was in, I'm um, sorry, architecture and urban planning. Because I went from the South, barefoot, out in the boonies, to the South side of Chicago, asphalt jungle, no trees, bars everywhere. Uh, food apartheid, these things weren't all that articulated that way. And it was like, why that, why, why the difference there? What, what's happening? What's going on? So that was really the thing. And so when I left, when I left Texas, we returned from Chicago to Texas. I left college, I, I moved to Seattle, and then I went to Alaska. Uh, and then I saw, I had already become vegetarian. I was doing fish and fowl in the boat. And after I left the boat, I was full on vegan because I had witnessed 
in one one move, it was started out as a health perspective and it went quickly to a kind of political and spiritual awakening in myself about the treatment of animals and what we were doing to the planet as a result of large mass scale agricultural production. Went on a fishing boat, saw what we were doing to the ocean and to fishing stocks and said, yo, that's not sustainable either. I thought I was doing all right. I got, I got rid of four legged in my diet. I went to fish and file. It can't be that environmentally impactful. Got on that boat, saw what was happening and realized that that also was the answer. I now eat meat, I eat fish and fowl again, but there was a 20 year period where I was, where I was vegan uh, because of those choices. So that's basically how I got into it. I got into it from, from music and culture and dietary choices. And then when I was in Seattle, I got off the fishing boat, got into organizing. And then in 90, I was there in 97, in 97, 98. No, I got back off the boat in 90, 98 and um then i got wind of the wto the wto what's the wto world trade organization the imf what's this alphabet soup and then i learned about the world trade organization and the international monetary fund and all these organizations that were that were part of this colonization of the world that was really continued to perpetuate perpetuate the underdevelopment of what we then called back then second and third world countries now we refer to as underdeveloped well, they didn't get underdeveloped by themselves. They got underdeveloped due to colonization and economic and political and religious oppression, to be quite frank. So that's the kind of short story of it. But the, what the WTO really blew my mind on that. And just, just the last part of that, the piece before that, I my, cut my teeth as an organizer, as an HIV AIDS organizer with the organization called People of Color Against AIDS Network. And that really opened my, my understanding up to gender oppression, um, uh, um, safe sex negotiation and how we had a very limited view of sexu sexuality and what limited rights uh, folks had in the two-spirit indigenous communities in communities of color, Asian American, API, Black and, and Latino communities around uh, their sexual orientation and the choices that they would make. So early on in my first beginnings as a political organizer and activist, I felt very fortunate to get those two groundings of a real understanding of you know, June Jordan as a poet was really important to me. Bell Hooks, uh, Barbara Ransbury, a number of feminists, uh, or womanists, as they would call themselves, um, scholars and activists really, really helped me. So what can white people do? Lois, that's the second. Luis, I think it's Luis. What can white people do? Well, you know, I work for the largest and oldest environmental organization that has almost uh, 4 million members. And the majority of those members are white. I might have some, some advice for white people. So I if have you a had quickie. a, yeah, what's the quickie? And it goes to with the what, what can white people do? So um, in your article that you wrote um, in October of mm -hmm. last year, before all of this started, um, you were very specific in the Sierra Club's role. You know, you went to support and went to step back and went to lift up partners. And, you know, it, after you answer the question, let's talk about staying in your lane. What, what does that mean? Yeah, well, I think in this moment, Lois, is it Lois? You can just put a stars or asterisk there. I think it's Lois. Um, and to whoever else is white who's asking that same question, but too shy to type it. What you're wondering and you're curious Please. is the, the fight for racial justice isn't just one for black and brown and indigenous people. Lo Louise, Louise, thank you. <laughs> Not Lois, Louise, Louise. It, the chat's kind of moving fast, um, but thank you for that phonetic spelling. I appreciate it. And Evan, I appreciate it. Let's do some Spotify playlists here with Theodore Payne and put some good jazz music on there. So uh, yeah, what can white people do and what can uh, majority white organizations do in this moment, which in this moment is the, the, the largest movement for human rights that, that this country has seen and probably the world has seen, right? The movement for black lives. And why I think that should resonate with people who even aren't black is because the fight against white supremacy and white supremacy, white supremacy doesn't just truncate the experience of black and brown and indigenous people. It also truncates the experience of white people. And I often ask folks who are wanting to do something about white supremacy or racism or injustice, I often ask them, why do you want to do something about it? What's in it for you? So I'm going to pause and I'm going to ask that very, how much time do we have? 
We've got uh, 10 minutes. Oh, snappers. But then we're going to go into the community discussion. And so we can, we can. Will I still be here for that? Going there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So we'll will they be, be asking me questions? So the will they be asking me questions or will they be talking amongst themselves? <laughs> They'll be asking you questions. Oh, great. Excellent. All right, cool. All right. So let me just take some feedback here in the chat or if the staff want to chime in, I want to ask why, if you do see injustice, why do you want to change it? Why, why, why do you work against injustice? Because I don't want to be treated that way. Okay, Brenda says she doesn't want to be treated. I want some. I want the POC, the BIPOC folks, to not say anything. I want the white folks to, to talk here. <laughs> I'll mute myself. Yeah. So why, if you're a white person, why do you fight for racial justice, and why do you think? How does injustice impact you, particularly if it's if you, you know, how does police brutality impact you? Our it impacts system. us on on every level. We, you know, there's. Um, if there is inequity in our system, it's it's affecting us all. And we, you know, if our <laughs> if we're walking down the street with our our neighbors, our friends, and they're, you know, we realize that they're getting pulled over, they're getting stopped, and this ha absolutely has to change. Mm -hmm. um, I think what was really uh, amazing about your article, Racism is Killing the Planet, is um, for me, it helped me really see how, you know, I think before I was working in a silo, I was really, you know, there's so many problems <laughs> in the world. And I had picked the environment and conservation as like the one thing that I thought I could work on and help solve. And what your article really did for me was see that the, the root cause of the problems that we face as an environmental community and uh, that we're facing with racism uh, are the same. <laughs> or maybe I got it wrong. I don't know, what nope. do you think? Nope, I'm not gonna, but I'm gonna ask if I might ask you a follow-up question, Erin. I might put you on the spot. Okay. Is that okay? You can say yep. no. Yep, do it. Okay, okay. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna look at the chats. Okay, so I, I, I appreciate your answer, but I think everything about your answer was external. So my question, I'm gonna repeat my question. Why do you, Aaron, in your life, fight against injustices that because of your own power and privilege, you aren't sub you're not subjected to directly, directly? Directly. Right, like for example, you don't get pulled over unnecessarily by the police. You don't risk, you don't fear that if the police, if you call the police, that you might end up being the victim, right? You don't worry if you have children or your uncle or your grandpa or your nephew, when they leave the house, they might not actually return because they've had an encounter with the police, right? That doesn't, right? I'm assuming some, some things that that's not a daily concern for you. You are assuming correctly. <laughs> okay, so given that, I Given why, why then, and I'm also assuming that you don't appreciate what is happening, that what happened with Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, that those are unconscionable, those are not democratic, they're not expressions of true democracy, they're not expressions of true justice. So why do you want to see that? Why, what's in it for you to not have those things happen? But that's not about other people, that's about you. So I can't say community because we're in this together. My neighbors, uh, you know, I have, I, you know, the people that I work with on a on a daily basis, the people I live next to, the people I'm, you know, they, this can't. Um, if if they go down, I'm going down with them. <laughs> Am I still? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to say this. Appreciate that. I think KPF Fluger, 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 I think he has something there in his answer, in their answer. I'm sorry, I don't know if they're great. Uh, I'll just say there. And so what I say to, to white people is it truncates your humanity too, because it forces you into certain belief systems and behaviors that uh, disallow you from being the, the human that you'd like to be, right? Absolutely. You have to put up with racist and sexist ideas when you go in the simplest ways, when you have family over, you go at the Thanksgiving table, mm -hmm. Uncle Bob, here he goes, you know, or you're in the company of other white people at work, someone says something racist, and you think, I don't really believe that, but because 
of your shyness or you want to keep your job or this isn't the right environment, you can't speak up. You feel like you can't speak up because you don't want to, you want to remain cool with those people. You want to remain your position inside society so you don't say anything. So I say that I think that we have to think about that for, for people who are not black. Uh, both non people, non black people and non indigenous people have to understand why what's in it for them um, for these other folks to have justice and it's because it, it, it dehumanizes dehumanizes all and it commits us to behaviors and a belief system that uh, disallows for true justice to happen for all of us. So, and I talk a bit about that in those and so Brenda to your question about how do we stay on lane so as a Sierra Club, our expertise is in protecting wildlands and fighting fossil fuel extraction and uh, things like that. So that's where we lead, where we have immediate and direct ex uh, expertise, right? Where we partner is on other issues where we see that that's central to helping us achieve our main central mission, right? Protecting, so like we might protect more and partner with wildlife organizations that have more expertise or the similar expertise in protecting uh, certain ecosystems to preserve wildlife habitat, right? We have some agency, but that's not our main thing. And so we can partner with people because we're aligned in that way. And then there are things like where we, where we don't have any uh, uh, necessary campaign or organizational experience, like the Move for Black Lives, right? We are not an organization, a racial justice organization that is actively work, has campaigns fighting against police brutality. But we do recognize that that dehumanization that's taking place is undemocratic and it's dehumanizing. And ultimately it's committing us as an organization to certain practices and beliefs that we actually don't believe in. So, but we're not gonna be out front necessarily putting out press releases or trying to own that work, but we're going to partner with other racial justice organizations in such a way that we can use our resources, our expertise to help lift their voices up and move that work forward. And then we're gonna educate our own staff board and members about the issues of racial justice and what they can do to support. So Luis, what can you do to support? You can log on to the Movement for Black Lives website. You can encourage the Theodore Payne organization to sign on to the Movement for Black Lives platform. There may be a Black Lives Matter uh, organization in your local community or other environmental justice or racial justice organizations. You could donate some money to them. You could pick up some books. You could read about, uh, let's see, you could read about, uh, you could le read about this great book by Barbara Ransbury, The Origins and the beginnings of an period of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. You could pick up this book about inner democracy, much like the um, issue around uh, food, ap uh, food apartheid. We talk about energy apartheid, where the transition from extractive fossil fuel uh, economy to a green, clean, uh, regenerative economy, that's a guarantee. That's going to happen. We're going to get off of fossil fuels. We're going to be able to be in a clean or green energy economy, right? But justice is not guaranteed in that transition. Right now, our, our energy system and our economic system feeds off of and uh, exploits indigenous, black, brown, and working class communities because that's where all the fossil fuel extraction takes place. That's where the trains roll through. That's where the, air, the airliners fly over. Airplanes don't really fly over this community. You go to South LA, you go to East LA, you go to communities of color, and they'll be directly underneath flight patterns. And you'll Would those why. be considered sacrifice zones? Those in some degrees, yes, because those are areas that we feel like, ah, it's not a big deal. The noise pollution, whatever, the, the residual air, air pollution that they have to deal with, where you're not going to see one plane fly over Beverly Hills. Yeah. So um, one of your themes through all of your writing is... yeah relationships matter in a right. crisis relationships matter so mm -hmm. wh what relationship can the native plant community form to help um in environmental justice as a social justice what what sure. can we do small things big things yeah well I, I think early. i think just on the immediate thing is you all can just come to some understanding about how you understand environmental justice I mean, I could tell you some things to do, but I don't know if that's going to resonate with you all. But I think, first of all, self-transformation. You all have to take it upon yourselves as individuals to understand the issues. First of all, why, why, why are these folks complaining? Quote, unquote, right? Um, and then what is it that we could actually do that's within our mission that resonates with our people? Uh, is it our hiring practices? Is it where we 
uh, is it is it I don't know exactly enough about the Theodore Payne Institute, but you could also help indigenous people in those communities, indigenous nations gain access to native plants in other areas, right? Because that's a huge cultural practice that they've been robbed of. They've been prevented from harvesting native uh, native plants that they're cultural, that's part of their cultural heritage. So that's one thing for sure that the native that the native plant society could could manage is helping change legislation that would give indigenous people their inherent right to practice their cultural heritage in the way they know that I mean that's a no-brainer for me to be honest with you um, right you could hire uh, and work with the indigenous communities in a really respectful way pay them a fair wage for their time when they come to speak right you could have them on your board you could hire them on your staff just don't reach out to them when you need an indigenous person to show up to do a smudge you know, to, to open up a ceremony or to say a few words, or have them as part of your organization. Yeah. Give them voting power inside your organization. Reach out to them before you need them to do something. If yeah. they have a campaign or something, that's what part of being a good partner, good partner is. Support them before you need them to do something for you. Oh, we hear you. We hear you. And we're ahead of the game on that one. We have right. a lot of programming coming up in the future. Um, uh, not only in Spanish, but featuring um, indigenous uh, presenters. Um, anything that's ethnobotanical, we strictly have a higher an indigenous person policy. But mm -hmm. let's let's. Talk and the other thing, I'll just be real. I don't know if you all have practiced something in meetings, like when I gave my introduction, I honored and 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 you know said where where I was coming from, unseated and occupied Tongva and Shumach territory. One recognizing that as a practice inside your organization is oh, beginning do. to do land acknowledgements. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, we, but I, then yeah. But also, and then we have to think about why are we acknowledging the land? Are we actually acknowledging and honoring the people in our organization or what other ways can we do that? And are the people who we're acknowledging that this is once their land, are they in struggle in other ways to get access to the land, to gain their land back? Why just stop at acknowledging that this is where they once were? Why not understand their own political, social, and cultural struggles and their quest to regain their sovereignty. Those are some good other additional ways to take that land acknowledgement practice to the next level, okay. but do it in a way that allows the indigenous folks or the folks of color or communities you're trying to reach out to, to lead and, and you all follow without trying to get out front of them and tell them, well, that's not the way you do it. This is the way we do it. Yeah. And I'm probably gonna say something that's probably gonna make some people upset and then I'll let you ask your questions. <laughs> is one of the comments, and then look, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the notorious RBG, rest in peace, large human being, an advocate for uh, women's rights and a constitutionalist in, in many ways. And we also have to look at, at, at her own limitations of Colin Kaepernick. She said his protest against race, uh, racial injustice and police terrorism to, to kneel during the national anthem was stupid and dumb, right? I don't agree with that. I don't agree that it was stupid and dumb. I mean, the, the, that song in itself, they've cut the last couple verses out. It's actually homage to slavery. If you listen to the, if you add those last, you'll have a different understanding of that song, to be honest with you. That's not me making it up. That's not Hop Hopkins. You can look it up yourself. Look up the history of that song. And so, you know, and she said something like, um, Standing up for your rights is good, but do it in such a way that people follow you. So if you're trying to stand up against anti-racism, are racists going to follow you? No. Did, did people follow Martin Luther King Jr. when he was alive and he was advocating for, for, for the rights of Black people? And by the way, the rights of Black people really are the rights for many other people, too. They did, and they vilified that brother. And ultimately, he was assassinated for his beliefs. And now... The moment some injustice pops up, people want to trot out Martin, Martin Luther King. He was also against the war. He was also against poverty. You know, there was a number of things that people forget about his, you know, trying to sanitize him. So I, I guess what, what I'm trying to say is if you're going to stand up beside people and not for people, the tactics that they use may not be the ones that you use or understand or even agree with. You have the responsibility, not them to understand why the choices they're making 
are different than yours. To sit in judgment is not the first step to take. Amen. Preach, huh? Preach. And here's another great book on chickens. <laughs> I don't want I don't want to lose my audience, but there's a really no. great book on chickens. No, we have it's time to get to the questions now. Okay. So uh, we have a lot of chicken questions. Um, so let's go uh, through through them. I think one was um, why corn free. Wow, another political question. Thank you. <laughs> no, it it ranges, it goes, the, but that's what we started. Well, corn, with. industrial agriculture. We grow more grain, and corn is one of them to feed animals than we do to feed humans. And 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 um, we try to reduce our corn. I mean, there are other protein sources that that we can utilize, and corn is heavily GMO'd, and it is one of those pro products that we grow way too much of. And to grow grain, we often deforest. Uh, areas nationally and internationally in order to grow grain uh, to, to, process, to, to feed meat. And uh, more, if we didn't do that, and if we redu reduced our consumption of meat, we, we, we produce more food globally to feed the world many times over. World hunger is not, uh, it's a choice that we're actively making on a global scale. And we dump more food and pay farmers not to grow food in some ways, um, because of market, because of market reasons, because food has become a commodity, much like real estate has become a commodity, much like the water we drink has become a commodity. So why not corn? Because corn is a labor intensive, petroleum intensive product, and there are other opportunities that we can grow that are less, that are less, um, uh, have less of a negative impact on our on our environment. What if I grow my own corn? Yes, please do, and share it with your chickens. <laughs> And I want and I, some too. I like sweet corn. <laughs> I like to eat it right off the cob, Ooh, right off the stalk. Corn pudding hot, mix them with that. I am down with it. It's one of my favorite things to make. <laughs> all right. Next, next that, chicken all question. All right, you guys. And let's see, I ask me can... a question. Let's ask a chicken question and see if it don't make it political. Just ask, just try. <laughs> all right. Why but Brenda, wait, 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 wait. Let's, um, let's bring up some people onto the screen so we can have, uh, so we can have oh. Scott pull people up and go into the gallery view. Yeah, hey everybody. Um, if you want to join us, we like to do the actual poppy hour portion here where we all just kind of have a little community moment and we can chat um, face to face. So raise your hand if you want to join. We'll, we'll just add the first couple of people who, who join. And, and thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. I know this is heavy stuff. This is not stuff that uh, some of you might have heard before. So. Um, I appreciate you for being here with us, and I appreciate Hop for for sharing his perspective. And um, you know, we're all in this together. So we, uh, you know, let's ask Hop some more chicken questions, maybe some, <laughs> maybe some political questions too. Hop, do worry, have... Don't worry, Evan. I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to join? Who wants to come up? Um, can I just start adding a few folks? Yeah. So some right. okay. Have, so uh, Chris, oh yeah. Chickens? How do you prevent what? from chickens? How do you prevent mites on chicken? Oh, mites on chicken. Yes, the other thing I want to show you. So this product here I use. Food grade, can you see that? Diatomaceous earth. Oh, diatomaceous earth, okay. Yes, now okay. there's a little bit of debate about the sustainability of grinding up these ancient fossil sea creatures, but it's, it is organic. And uh, I stretch it, and I meant to talk about this. So here, ba basically what this is, this is ancient, ancient sea crustaceans. And they're ground up to a fine powder. And I use this little doohickey right here. And let me see if I can show you. Did y'all see that puff of smoke? That was diatomaceous earth is in here. And I, I, I sprinkle it in their nesting boxes and in the coop area. And in the area that they like to, um, what's the word? Um, take dust, dust bath, dust bath in. Chickens like to take dust baths. And so I use this. And I also, when we have uh, fires out at night, uh, I take the, the ash and I grind it up and I put it into the run. And that ash and this diatomaceous earth, it gets into their feathers and it, it desiccates mites. So it dries their bodies out. And also on their poop in the coop, um, 
flies if the, you're going to have flies too. flies and my, mice and rats and my and mites go mm -hmm. hand in hand and we also have bees mm -hmm. so there are also um, uh, mites that get on bees so anyway that's the short answer i use diatomaceous earth and charcoal and uh snouty 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 is is live and big on my hey, screen snouty. now um so that's how we get rid of mites. And then I saw a, ch a question about someone asking a question about the connection between urban habitat restoration and mitigation of urban heating. And I'll say real quick, I was an urban forester for the LA Conservation Corps. I actually, got, I actually became a certified um, arborist. I became a tree, an official tree hugger. <laughs> and um, so mostly when I left the, my rural existence and went to Chicago, I noticed that there were hardly any trees. I mentioned this just offhand and that the urban island heat effect is when there aren't enough trees that those areas heat up a lot. So energy costs go up, off-gassing of asphalt and other things go up. It becomes a huge burden, not just on the off-gassing and the particulate compounds existent in those communities, but also in energy costs because it's much higher to heat and cool those areas where there isn't a forest cover. So there's a lot of research on that. So as an urban forester, I was part of the LA Conservation Corps during the time when uh, the previous mayor, Vera Gosa, had the Million Trees Initiative. So our organization, particularly in those areas where there were very little trees. And so planting trees and having native plants, you all should know this, there's a huge connection between reduct reducing uh, the heat atom effect, your energy costs, water consumption, and all those things by planting natives and uh, trees. You know, trees hold a lot of water, they give us back a lot of uh, oxygen and all those things. Pop, does the, does the Sierra Club have a, a, an active, like, urban restoration kind of program? Okay, so uh, I work on the national level. I used to work out of the LA office. Uh, my home chapter is the Angeles chapter and they have a conservation environment and environmental justice committee. And so if you want to kind of answer those questions, I won't fake the funk. Uh, I'm not certain. You would have to look up uh, on Google, uh, look up the LA chapter, the Angeles chapter uh, which there are different groups across the country. The Angeles chapter is the largest and oldest uh, Sierra Club chapter in our organization. Um, so um, they would be able to tell, they would be able to help you out. Cool. I mean, one of the things we're, we're doing here at Theodore Payne Foundation is trying to... Madeline, see you later. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, it's, Madeline's got to go. Shift people from thinking of the environment as like the, C the Sierra Nevada or this pristine natural area to, you know, East LA is the environment too, and we need to invest resources into uh, having that be a, a better place to live for humans and also for, for the planet. So I just, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that of, of rethinking the inner city as the environment, not, not a human place, but a, a collective space that's shared by humans and everything else that exists on our planet. Well, um, I really appreciate that question. And that was one of the big contributions um, that was a huge contribution of the environmental um, justice community was really helping us understand that the environment was more than just the wild spaces. It was actually also the place where we eat, where we sleep, eat, live, work, and pray, right? To expand the notion of the environment and also to expand the notion of, of uh, people not being separate from the environment, but people being a part of the environment. So part of the original concept of the environment was it was out there and people were separate from it. And from some of the religious underpinnings uh, that we get from things like the doctrine of discovery, man was put on earth in order to dominate the environment. The environment was here to be used as our beck and call. And that's one of the ways in which I think we get to this place of the kind of extreme extraction we see when we blow off mountaintops to get at the minerals and resources underneath that, right? Because it's just a resource for us to use, right? As opposed to seeing that when we blow off that mountaintop, uh, we're actually harming ourselves because it's, it's having an imp a negative impact on our environment. Right. And it's also having a negative picked out on us emotionally and spiritually, but we oftentimes don't really make that connection. So environmental justice taught us to see the environment more holistically. It wasn't just in those wild, far away spaces and that actually those wild and far away places um, has some deep connection to us and we to them. So those are the contributions, I think, of the environmental. Uh, uh, and just to be clear, the Sierra Club is an environmental organization, environmental conservation organization. We're not 
technically an environmental justice organization. We're an, organi an environmental organization that's trying to do our work in an intersectional way that recognizes that um, environment and justice for the environment is full is is integrated with justice for people. That those those two things are in inextric inextricably linked. And Snowdy, I'm sorry, is it Snowdy? Yes, it's Snowdy. Well, did you have a I question? Snowdy. I have a question. And because how did you get so big on my screen? <laughs> you know. Oh, you got to click the click the little grid view on your upper right top. It's okay. It's cool. Me? I now now Evan's really big. It's just that yeah. Go on, Snowdy. Ask your question. Well, um, I'm very active with Theater Pain Foundation. I've been on the board. I'm on the Arts Council. I'm Good for also, you. Congratulations. i I'm also very active with the California Native Plant Society. Um, one of the big parts of discussions that I've, especially with CNPS lately, is how, okay, we're, we seem to be, if you look at leadership, it's white people, okay? And there's nothing wrong with being a white person. If you nope. get involved in your, you're working your ass off, volunteering, all right, that's great. But that's not the that's not our universe it, you know go out into la or to california and california is not a white female universe and i think it's hard for you know back when i was working and um recruiting people we'd always say it seemed like everybody wanted to hire themselves and I think that's, is that what we want to try to figure out a way to do that we don't, quote unquote, hire ourselves in or, environmental organizations. That is, if you want leadership to reflect our multi-ethnic, multicultural um, community, how do you be inclusive. How do you how do you get people into the fold? Um, that's tough to me because I don't necessarily connect to a bunch of young folks that are multicultural, multi ethnic, and um, get them in leadership. Fine, they might work as volunteers, but you want somebody to carry on the torch and actually do the heavy lifting of an organization, whether it's TPF or CNPS or Sierra Club, whatever. Okay, so I saw someone say, if you build it, they will come. Yes, and um, no, just because you build it, they might not come. Uh, and, and you're asking a very profound and complex question. In some ways it has a very simple answer, in some ways it's very complicated. And I'm not trying to be overly dramatic or existential here. And uh, Snowdy, I just wanna say, I see your humanity and I see the angst and I see how challenging this is, this experience that you're relaying to me um, is for you. And there are many other people who I think in the chat and watching who feel very similar. And there's nothing wrong with being a white person, just to be clear. You can be anti-racist and still like, I have white people in my family. I, that's kind of a joke. It's a double entendre some way because that's always <laughs> what people say. <laughs> when you say, I'm not racist, I got a black boyfriend or I got a, you know, whatever. Or I got a black guy at work I talk to every now and then. So it was just kind of a little joke to bring some letters. Some of my but actually, friends are. Yeah some, of, yeah, some of my family members are white and some of my good friends are white. So yeah, it's nothing wrong with white people. I think there's something wrong when we have to think about white privilege and white nationalism, white supremacy. That's the challenge that we have and what it does. And so I'm not gonna be able to answer this for Theodore Payne or for you in the time that we have. I think it is this thing around self-transformation and a practice. And the Theodore Payne has to understand as an institution and as a member and as a board member, you all have to understand what you want your organization's orientation to be around justice. And there's lots of ways that I think that the Theodore Payne Native Plant Society as an organization can be on the right side of history even in this moment of Black Lives Matter. I think that wholeheartedly. 
And if you choose to do it, that's great. If you choose to don't do it, that, that's less great, but that's okay. That's what you all choose to do. But I do think there's a role for every organization and institution and individual to do something for justice that's th that keeps them in their lane, that is around charity, it is around solidarity, not charity, that actually helps transform both the or institution and the organ and the individuals inside the institution to really um, um, think about justice for themselves and others in a different light. So I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna try to take 10 or 15 more seconds to be very direct with, with you. And I think this goes to the thing about if you build it, they will come. Part of it is in the journey that we're on, and I'll use the Sierra Club as an example. Just because you commit to equity, inclusion and justice or racial justice as a framework doesn't necessarily the end result isn't necessarily that more people of color or gender non-conforming people are going to join your organization if you want more brown people or black people or gender non-conforming people to, to join your organization you can do that and still not be a uh, not center equity and justice so i'm just trying to say one doesn't beget the other right and what I have to say to our members, if you live in a state that doesn't have an overabundance of people of color, you can still have a justice and anti-racist orientation. That's still very important. So you have to think about what your goal is as an organization. If what you're trying to do is you're trying to diversify your organization to bring more different people in, or if you're trying to be a justice organization. And I, I submit to you that you could be the latter, a justice oriented a racial justice organization as Theodore Payne and remain as white as you are right now. <laughs> and you could have and you could have more impact in the world, if you ask me, than trying to just get more people of color and then not not develop a racial justice orientation. That is not really helpful in this moment. That's tokenizing, that's chauvinistic, uh, and that's really problematic in my in my view. And many organizations get caught in that trap because they don't actually know how to do it. And then they end up just hiring more people of color. They don't change the culture and the institution and the structures in the organization. Those folks come on as volunteers or staff. They have a horrible time. They end up getting pegged as being the problem. Everything was fine until you got here. These things weren't issues. Why are you talking about this? What are you saying? And then they end up leaving, getting fired, or get pushed out. That's damaging. That's harm and trauma. Versus let's think, let's think about our organization, culture, and let's think about our orientation to justice. If you do that, so I agree, whoever put in there, if you build it, you will come. If you develop a, ju a racial justice orientation as white as you are, or given who you are first, you'll then begin to examine your organization, culture, structure, decision-making processes and resource allocation. And you'll begin to make different decisions. You'll begin to, to allocate your resources differently. And just that alone, people will see that. They'll see how you move in the world and they will come. One Trust last me. question, Hop. One last yes, question. Yes, yes. It is getting a little dark, isn't it? Yeah. Have you ever felt like giving up on a very white organization such as the Sierra Club? That's a question from Carlos Flores. And what keeps you believing and keeping engaged? Well, if I gave up on an organization like the Sierra Club, I'd be giving up on society. Now, our members in Theodore Payne and the Sierra Club are society writ large. So I choose to do my work in this way, and it's a very particular orientation. And I will say why, because I think if you look at the last several elections, white middle class, women in particular, um, voted a certain way. And I think that gave us a certain political moment that we were living in. And we have been speaking directly to white middle class, well-educated people for 127 years. Racism is not a problem of black people. We are not gonna solve it on our own. Anti-indigeneity, indigenous sovereignty is not a problem of, 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 of indigenous people. That's a white supremacist, white nationalist problem. If we have any, any, if we have any success or any hope of defeating these system, these institutionalized systemic historic injustices, white people have to take a different orientation to white supremacy and white nationalism. Meaning that they have to do the self-transformative, trans, self-transformative work to, or to examine their own power and privilege, and then choose to do something actively about it every day. I have some issues with Ibrahim X's book around his framing and, and definition of racism. But what I do agree on is 
it's not, I think this quote came from him, is it's not enough not to be racist. You have to actively be anti-racist. It's not enough to just not be anti-gay. You have to actively be anti-gay. So there are two different orientations that are gonna get you two different results. One is good and one is very much better. And with that, I'll say, Brenda, thank you so much, Chaparral Chick, for calling me. And I only say that because it's your handle. I don't typically call people chicks. I typically call chickens chick. But uh, uh, That's your sign off, Hop. Your sign off is open heart, open eyes, open hands. What's, what's the last one? Oh, she's putting me on the spot. I'm going to fail name? this test. I'm going to fail this test. Open heart, open eyes, open hands. Open hands. I got that part. Now open I'm done. You can, right? That's right. Help Those you are can. your That's words. Right. Those so, are my hands. And it's right. Many hands make light work. You told me you're pushing right. back my own. So many, many hands make light work. Thank you so much. Thank Aaron, you. Evan, Snowdy, Scott, really appreciate you. Members and volunteers of Theodore Payne, rock and roll. Have a good time. Stand up for something. Don't or you'll fall over for anything. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, we'll see you later. guys next month. We're going to talk about fire. Thank you. We're coming up next month. Hop. Uh, check Hop out on his Facebook and on his articles on Sierra Club. Amazing articles. Hop Hopkins, thank you so much for joining us. Right on. See Peace and love, y'all. All right. Thank you, Hop. All right. Be well. Yeah. We'll try and get the book list to everyone um, later. Yeah, yes, we'll I'll follow send up, you, we'll follow up send with links you. for everybody. Yeah, so, we'll do that. So uh, you'll get another email and, and some links. Thanks. I'll do that if, if you give if you guys share a Spotify list from your members, I'll share my book list. There's the challenge. <laughs> oh, all right, we got right. a punk, punk and jazz playlist. Uh, and, and that's book right. List the up. staff and member playlist. I want I want offerings from staff and from members. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> all right. Listen. Coltrane's and Coltrane and Bad Brains. That's right. That's what I want to talk about. Some McCoy Tyner, all that good stuff. All right. Oh. The Sidewinder. I'm loving it. Come on, bring it home. Punks it and on. Plants. Okay, that's a good playlist name. That's right. Punks <laughs> and Plants. And Mar what is that? Marissa? Marissa? That's all. That We're going to credit her with it. Punks and Plants. I love it. Uh, punks, Plants, right. and Politics. I'm adding to it. Punks, Plants, and Politics. Punk See y'all later. And politics. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.